meeting of the Minnesota House of Higher Education uh, Finance and Policy Committee or Division to order. Thank you members for being here so early today. We've had some late nights and it's nice to know that we get to leave at three o'clock today. So um, today I'm uh, pleased that we're bringing legislation before that number of legislators in the Office of Higher Education have been working on to help our Argosy students. So um, I, th I think what I'll do before it will call up the Office of Higher Ed as I move the bill. So I move House File 2849 to be referred to Ways and Means. And then what I'll do is as well to get it in the order that the, that the author would like is, um, and I just, I just want to let you know before I do this, a number of members have signed on to this, and I don't know how when these print out it says authored by Bernardi. I, I, don't, I just want to make sure that if we can just follow up that everybody else's name has been added to it, because I've never like noticed that the other names aren't added. They don't add the other names. That was printed the first day. Okay, so I just want to make sure all the members who have been on it are included as well, because it's definitely a bipartisan effort. Um, so I move um, Amendment A-1 to be, that is a good enough referral. I, I move uh, um, Amendment A-1, well, 2849-A-1. Any To get in the order I'd like. Anybody have any questions? Okay. All those in thing, uh, favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The amendment passes. Okay, now we have it in the form that we would like, and welcome to our committee. If you could please state your names for the uh, record, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Madam Chair uh, and members. Dennis Olson, the Commissioner of the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. Thank you, Mr. Mrs. Chair. Uh, Betsy Talbot, Minnesota Office of Higher Education. I am the Manager of Institutional Registration and Licensing. Okay, welcome to our committee. If you could walk through the bill for us and um, let us know how this will help our Argosy students, that would be, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair and members, thank you. And we appreciate the opportunity to um, address the committee uh, and, and thank you for the invite um, and for the um, willingness to, to carry and hear this bill um, to provide relief for our um, Argosy University students that were um, unfortunately displaced uh, due to the abrupt closure of the university. And um, we, we hope through this bill to provide them uh, financial relief through <coughs> numerous um, opportunities for them to receive their uh, state financial aid uh, program dollars that were due to them um, and were unfortunately unpaid as well as provide relief to uh, students who were self loan borrowers um, who had a uh, Minnesota self loan on the books and unfortunately did not receive uh, the the balance for those uh, loans that were taken out. Um, Madam Chair, th those are really the basics. If you want me to walk in detail through the bill, I certainly could do that. But um, it's primarily providing students uh, related to Argosy University only uh, the the relief from financial aid as well as self loans, and then um, a report required from the Office of Higher Education. Uh, to the legislature. Okay, so um, members, I think what we'll do is ask members of the committee if they have questions. I heard one before, and so we waited until prime time to get on it. Representative Lehman, would you um, please ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess the, com uh, the question is for the commissioner, and uh, thanks for being here this morning. Glad to be doing this and helping these students. But my question is, um, where is the money coming from to enable us to do this? Um, uh, Commissioner Olson. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Lehman, um, we will be uh, utilizing existing funds at the Office of Higher Education to, um, to make these students uh, whole, at least through, through this portion of their financial aid. And so we'll be uh, utilizing self-loan balance as well as um, as well as balances in other financial aid programs. And I'm actually going to ask uh, Ms. Talbot to uh, walk through some other opportunities for financial um, uh, recovery through, through legal process and court proceedings. Okay, Ms. Talbot. 
Madam Chair, Representative Lehman. So uh, a little bit more detail. The self loan will be coming from the self loan reserve uh, fund and the several of the programs uh, will be just using the existing funds that was, should have already gone to the students. Uh, those payments had not been made from the Office of Higher Education to Argosy University yet. And so those are the exact same funds that they would have already received. Um, and then the rest of the funds and then part of the self loan um, we're trying to recoup through the receivership in an Ohio federal court. There, uh, through court proceedings, we did find out that there is a special account that's labeled Minnesota State Grant uh, that was preserved and was not liquidated by the corporate entity. And so we're going to be trying to recover those funds on behalf of the, the general fund in the, in the state of Minnesota. And then we're also going to be trying to make a claim against a small bond that they had with us and uh, hopefully again trying to make the state whole through this whole process or at least minimize the amount that the the office of higher education is going to have to absorb okay. well, madam chair just a representative follow-up question for you um so what level reserves does oh, does the department maintain you, you said the first the first thing you do is would tap your reserves do you have i mean is that Ms. Talbot. Madam Chair, Representative Lehman, I'm not actually quite sure of the dollar amount, but the, how the self loan is funded is that we we get funding for like to give out loans and then as the loan money comes back in, we pay back investors and we move money around and I mean, it, 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 this is a very small percentage of that fund, but it has to do with the financial health of the self loan itself. Um, so it's just, again, trying to minimize the cost of and the expense of maintaining the self-loan program in and of itself. And Madam Chair, yeah, if you could, just one more follow-up question. Yep. Do you have any idea of the size of the fund that Argosy was maintaining for the, the student the grant program? Ms. Talbot. Madam Chair, Representative Lehman, yes, it was about approximately $62,000. So it's pretty on par with the amount that we need to send out mm -hmm. of the office related to double payments for the grant programs and, and then a little bit extra that would go towards the self-loan program and reimbursing the self-loan program. Thank you. Yes, and what I'd actually like to do is actually go back to the bill because I'm, I'm quite familiar with the bill, but maybe not all of our members um, had a chance to dig deep into it. So if we could just go through each sections and the reason why we're doing it, and I, I just really appreciate the work that's been put in this because the the work it, you guys are as i understand have everything ready to go mm -hmm. and this is going to be activated as soon as we get this bill passed and to help our students and so i really appreciate that and so if we could just go through each of the subdivisions or sections it would be great and then members can ask questions along the way i think that would be a good way to do it okay so who would like to ms talbot Thank you, Madam Chair. So the first section is the definitions to try to make sure that we are limiting this specifically to Argosy University and related to the abrupt closure on March 8th. And then we're also trying to limit it to kind of the, the financial aid that was specifically impacted in that spring term. And we have a couple fall summer issues um, that Argosy was not able to resolve prior to their closure. And uh, the next part is the eligibility, again, is the students who uh, were beneficiaries of those state financial aid programs. And the next section is kind of where we're going to start talking about which programs are impacted by this. So the first one is going to be the post-secondary child care grant. That's the grant program that students are supposed to use to help pay for child care when they have minor children. And then we have the self loan program, which we've been mentioning. It's the Minnesota sponsored uh, educational loan used by students who are attending a Minnesota institution. And then we also have the Indian scholarship. That's for students obviously who are eligible for uh, based on their heritage. And then the Minnesota GI Bill. Those are students who are eligible for a grant program based on their prior military uh, service. And what is allowing us to do is, first of all, let's talk about the self loan program, which is to um, discharge the spring loan usage. So if a student had borrowed a loan for spring, uh, we've determined that they did not receive an educational benefit from that loan and that they're, we are going to reverse it out essentially. And they'll no longer have to pay for loans that were intended for the spring semester. 
And then for the state grant, we're making direct payments of state grant funds to the students as opposed to making the funds go directly to the school. And the reason why we chose to do that is because um, in the news, and we're quite aware that um, Argus University was not paying stipends to students or student aid financial aid refunds. So anytime a student has more financial aid than their tuition and fees, that money is supposed to go to them. And that's supposed to be used towards living expenses, books, gas, housing, um, and so they can complete their educational program. For the state grant, we're specifically limiting it to the, the fees that are in excess of the tuition and fees uh, because we don't want the institution to come after them uh, and for any unpaid balance because they might because we are reversing the funds and we're not giving them the funds, they might take those funds off their account um, and they were already recorded on their account. And then we are uh, doing it a little differently for the Indian Scholarship and the Child Care Grant and the GI, and as opposed to the excess of tuition and fees, and it has to do with those programs and how they're typically administered. With the GI Bill and the Indian Scholarship, you have a lifetime max that you can use it, but you can choose when you use it. And so we're allowing the student to choose if they want to receive this grant now or reserve that eligibility for a later time. And that's why there's that language to allow the student to opt out. And then for the child care grant, um, those funds are supposed to be used for child care expenses. And we know that these students received those funds. And they're, so we're going to uh, make a direct payment again for those for those programs so that those students were able to pay back their childcare providers during uh, the, the semester where they, they were in school again until March 8th. And the next session, section again is we're going to try to resolve this for all students, make direct payments, figure out the release or just, you know, the, the reversal of the loans by October 31st. And we will communicate with all, all students on our website and direct communications with students about this process and what their eligibility is for and correct addresses, et cetera. And then the last section, subdivision four, is that we're gonna be doing a report for, for, your, uh, for your committee so that we can report back on the payments that we made to students, how much for each student, um, you know, the min max, their fiscal note does kind of outline that possibility and also the self loan uh, uh, reversals. And then update you guys on how students, the outcomes for students after the abrupt closure, kind of where students landed and any other actions that we took on behalf of Argosy University students. Okay, uh, Representative Daniels. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I've got a couple just uh, questions just because it's been a long week and uh, we've got a birdie and I'm a little groggy. Um, but uh, subsection four and then uh, line six suggested legislative action to prevent future school closures. Um, do you have anything in mind at this point uh, that we could actually start uh, drafting before we leave for a session? Um, or is that just uh, kind of out there for future thoughts? Uh, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Olson. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Daniels, yeah, thank you. We do have uh, plenty in mind. Um, there are there are things we could um, put in place right now, but we want to bring a comprehensive package together next session. Uh, there's a lot of discussions and, and planning that still needs to happen with our financial aid manager, managers to make sure that um, we don't have any unintended consequences um, if we try to do something too quickly. Um, particularly around um, tax implications and um, authorities for the for the agency, so we want to make sure that everything uh, works in concert with with each piece, and so uh, we'll bring a comprehensive package together. But there are a few things. Uh, Ms. Talbot may have some ideas in mind right now of, of things that we're certainly thinking of. Ms. Talbot, Madam Chair, I apologize, I forgot your name already. Daniels. 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 Um, one of them, uh, you know, related to preventing future school closures and, and ensuring consumer protections is expanding the focus on financial viability. Hmm. You know, when we look at about whether institutions are good actors, bad actors, in the end of the day, what prevents a closure is whether the institution is solvent or not. And we need a better response to institutions who are having solvency issues. 
and we need to find solutions that allow us to have surety requirements or a way to fund these losses that students have that don't actually cause a closure. Because unfortunately, the, the financial reporting mechanisms now are very tied to the U.S. Department of Education's metrics, and those are typically about two years behind. And with institutions, especially right now, we've been having a very strong economy, enrollment is down nationally, schools are running out of cash very quickly. And so being two years behind on financial measures is not sufficient to determine whether we need a surety requirement. So I know at the U.S. Department of Education level and our offices level is trying to find better ways to, to, to ensure the institutions who want to come into our state to offer programs for the first time are really financially viable and how to resolve the institutions who are already here and have enrollment and we want those students to complete their programs to remain solvent and not harm students by making the decision to close in the middle of a term or before students can complete their program. Thank you. And then, Thank, um, Representative Daniels. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then uh, another question, I'm still a little foggy on, on the, the uh, costs, where they're coming from. I see in one sheet we're absorbing 155,000 of second costs. But in uh, another page, uh, being distributed to students, 245,000. And my brain was sharper. I'd probably do all the rest of the reading, but I thought maybe it might be easier to explain it to the rest of the committee about how all the numbers are going to work out and who's going to get reimbursed and not get reimbursed. Commissioner Olson. Yeah, and Madam Chair, my apologies. I don't have the fiscal note in front of me. Um, and I'm actually going to look to, I know we had a summary sheet um, of the, the numbers that are impacted, or the individual programs that are impacted. Madam Chair, if, if I can, oh, here we go, thank you. I have a paper copy. So this is where the additional cost is coming from, but this is the amount we're paying directly. So it's really not this full amount, and we're trying to make it a constitutional system. And then we're also just add to it. Let's go through with that now. Madam Chair, is it, all, is it all right if I answer? Sure. Okay, so I'm looking on page three of the fiscal note. So what's interesting about what's happening with this Argosy bill is that some of the payments are a double payment and some of them are not. And so on page three, we have a, a, a table, table number one. One says additional cost amount and, the, and then this, the, the fourth column says amount being dispersed directly to students. So the amount that the Office of Higher Education is trying to absorb is at the $181,293. And the amount mean um, benefiting students is the $245,000. So the first of the 181 is the, actually where we are having to resolve what that's coming from. So there is that $62,000 that we're trying to recover from the receivership, and we're using the Attorney General's office to do so. And then that brings that down to, again, one hundred and twenty. dollars and that's what we're hoping to get reimbursed and have Argus University pay itself, either through the bond or through the receivership itself. Thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Olson. And, uh, yeah, Madam Chair and, and Representative Daniels, um, the fiscal note was really built on some uh, fiscal assumptions that in, impacts we had uh, pulled together internally, and I'll just go through kind of the five buckets really quickly so you understand the impact of each. So for the, the state grant program, uh, the impact is up to 79 students uh, representing uh, $52,900 roughly. Uh, for the child care grants, it's up to 16 students uh, representing about $24,000 maximum. For the Minnesota GI Bill, uh, up to six students impacted and up to $5,000 as a ceiling there. Uh, for the Minnesota Indian Scholarship Program, again up to six students. Uh, about $10,900 there as a maximum. And for the self-loan program, up to 45 students impacted, uh, representing a ceiling of about 155000 Thank you. Vice Chair, Vice Chair, um, Prior. Prior, yeah. <laughs> Fuzzy brains. <laughs> <Right>. Thank you, <laughs> Chair Bernardi. Um, and you, there was a brief mention before uh, timelines. So as soon as this is signed by the governor, um, what what's the range of, 
of how quickly students actually would receive the, the money. Commissioner Olson? Yeah, Madam Chair and uh, Vice Chair Pryor, um, ASAP, um, each, each uh, program has different timelines, but we're essentially positioned right now to, to flip the switch and, and get the money out. We know who the students are, mm -hmm. um, the, the amounts that, uh, that they are due, um, and are just working out a, a couple of, of small pieces. For instance, the, the state grant program doesn't allow us to issue uh, cents, only so we use rules of rounding. Um, and so those, those type of things have to still be worked out, but essentially the switch is ready to be flipped and, and money can go out the door. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I just want to thank you so much for knowing, I, I, I get the sense and the testimony you've provided and the work I've been doing, w doing with you that you know these students, you've contacted these students, you got their records, you were proactive and we're positioned today so we can move quickly because of your efforts and I want to thank you for that. Okay, so um, Rep, uh, Representative Cleborn. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question still goes back to the um, testimony that we heard from students when they were here before, and I don't see it addressed in this bill. Um, when the students went to the school management at that time and asked about their funds, the ongoing nature of the school, they were encouraged to withdraw. And so some of the students have signed withdrawals, which will have an impact on their federal loans as well. My question is, can we, can we negate those withdrawals in this bill, saying that those withdrawals are not valid? Uh, invalidate, that's what I was thinking of. Can we invalidate those withdrawals during a certain time period? so that the students would not be classified as having quote, withdrawn from the university so that those student loans on the federal level could be um, dealt with. However you would. Ms. Talbot. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Claybor, uh it actually doesn't end up being, it, from a financial aid perspective, the withdrawals should not impact them in any way. Um, the reason for that is that the U.S. Department of Education is already discharging all loans that were incurred for the spring semester, regardless of their withdrawal status. So, and then also for the state financial aid purposes, due to the complexity of the withdrawals, the abrupt closure, we are not going through the typical refund recalculation process. So for the purposes of, again, state financial aid and federal financial aid, those withdrawals will not have an impact on them. And also for if they wanted a closed school discharge, that meaning they're just going to wipe out all of their Argosy loans, not just the spring semester. Mm -hmm. They needed to be enrolled within 120 days of the closure, which puts it farther back um, than even in, it's in the false term that they could have withdrawn from and still get all of their loans discharged. So thankfully, there should not be a ramification if they, they opted uh, to withdraw early. Thank you very much. That satisfies my question. Yeah, thank, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, oh, Representative Quam. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And that line of questioning brings up a good point. And we should look at being proactive and see if we should put in some things that cover these type of topics so that it's great that we were able to do that, um, you know, within the agencies, et cetera. But if we actually have it stipulated that might uh, ease some fears, because how long did it take to come to this point where if it's automatically put in statute, they can have that reassurance that it's not quite as bad as it you know, seems to be. Thank you, Representative Kwame. It seems like you're on the same page as the rest of the committee as well. We talked about it before you got here that we will be working on that in the interim and bringing back that legislation for our next session. Okay, so I have a question not specifically about this bill. I want to, a lot of uh, members have been working closely in the, addressing the, um, the clinicals yeah. for the students to be able to finish their dental hygienist course, well, not coursework, but their clinicals. And it seems that there's a positive movement moving forward, and by May 15th there's going to be a resolution and the students can start May 23rd but I don't want to take it for granted. I just want to make sure all everyone's on the same page and is there anything that we need to do? So um, are you able to answer 
that question at all because I know there's a lot of players in the Century College and the CODA, which is the what what does CODA stand for? The they're the people that govern the dental hygienist accreditation. Let's just say that. So I just I feel like we got control of it, but but there's the buts. <laughs> um, so I want to know what we need to do and the status of that. Uh, Madam Chair, well, we're like you said, we're very optimistic. Just to make sure everyone's on the same page, uh, we do have a Min State College who is stepping forward and trying to work with the accreditor to teach out those students who are supposed to complete um, May 1st with their program. And obviously it's delayed, but they have submitted a proposal, a formal proposal, because we did informally had talked about this um, arrangement with CODA I, before the school, or in March, I believe, so shortly after the school closed. So now it's a very formal uh, request, which does meet the accreditor's requirements to, to go through the proper review process. And we're hopeful that CODA will approve it. Um, I, we obviously have no control whether the accreditors do approve something or not. They, but CODA has been expressing um, a lot of eagerness to help these students too. They understand how tumultuous this is for them and that we have limited resources within the state to resolve this issue just because of the number of dental hygiene programs we have and the number of institutions who are local and close to the Argosy campus so students don't have to travel very far and that it's very important um, for employment purposes for these students to get it done as quickly as possible. So that I, I am positive about how CODA is very willing to, to help these students. And that's a very good point because when I use the word control, I'm like, that was not a good word to use because we don't have control over this, but we have been help shepherding the process to be sure that a decision is made and these students are taken care of. So um, I'm hopeful too, but they are the accrediting agency and do have to approve it. But so, so our members know the the plan is by May 15th, the CODA, the crediting agency, will hopefully approve. That's their decision, but that's what we're hoping. That's what we're working towards. Um, and let Century College and the students know that they have been approved to take on those students. And then they would start, the students would start May 23rd and be able to finish their clinicals over the summer. That's, is there any other information that would be important to share with our members? Madam Chair, the only thing I would mention, is Talbot. Is, oh, I apologize, Madam Chair, is that the um, CODA, they also have to take a national certification exam, but mm -hmm. CODA has also expressed that they are willing at the drop of a hat to schedule that. And so once they complete the clinicals, CODA has been very flexible to allow those students to schedule that as quickly as possible so that they can get licensed in the state of Minnesota to be a dental hygienist and assume those job offers that they have already received. Right. Okay, yes, um, Vice Chair Pryor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, 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 we had, we, there were other students too that came forward and we know that there are other students that um, have been negatively impacted. Is there any updates on some of the other programs? Ms. Talbot? Madam Chair, Representative Pryor, yes. Um, so let's talk about the PsyD program first. That was the Doctorate of Clinical Psychology where there was not a lot of programs in our state it was making the national news about the lack of availability for these students to transfer. <coughs> I can tell you informally that there is some institutions who are interested in um, acquiring that program and starting it, which is really good in the long term for the state of Minnesota because they fill a very and much needed mental health um, access point for Minnesota residents. We also have uh, one institution who's coming next week from Chicago, who was one of the original teach out partners, but obviously our students do not want to commute to Chicago. And so because of the large population, they're actually interested in establishing a physical presence here and opening up a location to, to teach out the currently enrolled students and then also offer the program in the long term as kind of a satellite location, which is really great also. Um, and actually one of our local institutions um, may be helping them with that space as kind of a, 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 just to again help facilitate our Minnesota institutions, our Minnesota students. So that's the PsyD program. So we're getting more optimistic about that program that we are getting more creative solutions than when, uh, that we had previously seen. One of the other programs that was problematic, we actually have a student here 
um, who was in the diagnostic sonography program for ECHO. And that one was problematic because most of the programs in the state are just for general sonography. Mm -hmm. um, some students are going out of state, which is never our goal. We want them to be able to stay local. Um, but we do know of one institution that has acquired all of the equipment for the sonography program and is going to be moving through the approval process to offer the program. And so that's a really good sign. The other program, um, which we don't have, a, we have two programs we haven't had a lot of movement on. And one of them is Histo Technology. It's an associate degree program. It is a very much needed program. Argosy supplied most of the Histo techs for the state of Minnesota. Um, and hospitals do need these trained personnel, but it's a very expensive program to offer. Uh, we have not heard from any Minnesota institution who would be interested in offering it other than a Minn State campus, but there is a funding issue for that. Mm -hmm. And then lastly is the doctorate in marriage and family therapy. While there was a program that was a teach out option through online, it was not a very good fit for our residents. And so I was hoping to find a, a school that was out of state that would be willing to temporarily come into the state and help offer that program. Uh, but we have not found an institution that has an overlapping similar curriculum that would be a good fit to come in to do that. So uh, I should mention it with the Histotech program, um, it, it is my understanding that there is a school in Texas that's going to try to complete out the currently enrolled students. But, and it's through online mechanisms, so they don't have to travel to Texas. Again, it's still not ideal, but long term, uh, we do have an issue in the state of not having a histotechnology program to serve the, the, the medical field's needs. And uh, Ms. Talbot, I have a follow-up question to that. Is there, a, is there a solution for that? Have people come forward and said, this is what we need to make this happen, and this is the need in our state for this occupation? Because, I mean, our role, we do fund Minnesota State. I would like to know, I would like our committee to know about if there's barriers, if and if it's funding, what does that look like? And uh, so I think that's a really important thing. But it sounds like the students are going to be taken care of. Mostly. Mostly, okay. Um, well, I want them all to be taken care of. So that would be, I, if they haven't been taken care of, that's a bear, that's something that, you know, we, we want to know about too. But um, I'd like to know the solutions sooner the better. You know, I mean, this is our fund, this is our funding year and um, might not be able to do it that, might be, not be able to do it that fast, but we certainly want to attempt to solve the problem if we can earlier than later. Uh, Madam Chair, Good news is that we have been in close communication with one of the lobbying groups for this program, and we've already communicated them about your desire to help. And so she was going to the Minnesota State campuses to communicate with them, and they do have your contact information. So I think, um, you know, again, staying in that communication with the group, the you know, the medical health care field that kn knows about that issue, um, and that uh, she has already been starting to work with the Minn State campuses to, to develop the program and figure out where it would be a good fit. Um, and she's been going to the different campuses for Minn State and having meetings with them. And they have to, again, develop the curriculum, get a long-term plan to get that program accredited because it does require programmatic accreditation. So I'm hoping that maybe in the next year we might, we might see some movement uh, on the development of that program at a new campus and we'll start seeing how, what the schools specifically need in order to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, we're going to, um, I, 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 we have one more person on the list. Oh. And no, no, you, yes. no, no, Representative oh. Cleveland, but I just want to say we want to be able to have time to walk over and get there by 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if there's any other members, we will try to accommodate your questions and move through very quickly. So Representative Cleveland. Well, my question was just really quickly on this histo technology. It, I just searched it to see exactly what it was to make sure I was correct. It does sound like something, especially with an aging population, that would be really important for our state. I saw that Wisconsin has in their state system a program. Um, have we reached out to Wisconsin to see if they could accommodate the children? Or students, not children, <laughs> students. Forgive me. Uh, Ms. Talbot. Madam Chair, Representative uh, Claver, yes, we have. Um, again, it's a, it's a program that's limited by lab space, and it's very chemical-driven and things like that. Right. So we, we do have students who, for example, are going down to Mayo 
clinic, for example, to complete their program. It wasn't a very large program, student population size wise, but um, we hope soon to be able to get um, a response from students of whether they've been able to land and complete their program. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Members, any other questions? Okay, well, oh, we do what? Uh, uh, Representative Nornis. Uh, uh, Chair Bernardi, I, I just said a I guess the question not related to this, if right. that's okay, sure. since we may not meet as a committee right. for a while. Yeah. Um, for the benefit of our members and also for the benefit of those that have applied to be Board of Regents, do you have any updates on when we might have a convention? I, oh, I, he was like shaking his head, so I was, <laughs> you were communicating with Representative Quam. I do not have an update. I know that there's been exchanges. It's in the hands of the um, speaker and the majority leader, Gazelka and Speaker Hortman, to come to an agreed date. And that's the last I knew is that there's been communications and trying to We're come running, to agreement running on a short date. Of time, so that just right, concerned. Exactly. That's, that's my a last update. People involved in that process that are out there just kind of waiting, right? wondering. Right. And so hopefully that can be resolved. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. So I would like to. Um, I, we we need to do business of passing this the bill. <laughs> right. Exactly. I didn't know the question wasn't going to be related to it, but I didn't want to cut Representative Nornis off. So um, members, I would like to renew my motion for House File 2849 to be referred to Ways as amended. Thank you very much. To Ways and Means. All those in favor. In favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes. We also have an, uh, a minute, to, one of the minutes to pass, and that is for, uh, let's see, April 10th. Is it what, okay. So move, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Vang, for moving the minutes for April 10th, 2019. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those aye. opposed? The motion prevails. So thank you, members. We may not see each other for a while. And I want to thank our committee members for the great work they did this year. And it's fun to be able to work bipartisanly and to help our students in the great state of Minnesota. And it's fun to have been, it, 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 it's great to be able to partner with the Office of Higher Ed and the constituents of the state of Minnesota. So I appreciate the Argus students that were here and all the students and um, people who care about higher ed who have testified and been here over our um, session this time. So thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned.